afternoon, Cloud Native community, and welcome back to Chicago. We're here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, CNCF's largest North American event. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined here by my fabulous co-host Rob. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Are you? Do you have you have you know have people commented on how well you match the branding for the event today? Uh, I, you know what? You were the first. Well, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Not, not shocking me, but, either, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> I'm excited for our segment this afternoon. We have a CUBE alumni. He's been on the show four different times and coincidentally also has had four funding rounds to complement that, most recently raising a $115 million Series C up round in January, which in this ecosystem, landscape, and economy is a serious accomplishment. Martin, it is so great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much, and looking forward to our conversation today, and hopefully we can keep that run going. Uh, four for four right now. So. I know, <laughs> I love that. Hopefully, hopefully we didn't jinx it, five yeah, exactly. golden rings. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see you in Paris, yeah, maybe that'll be the case, hopefully, and we can talk about it then. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot going on with Chronosphere. Yeah. You had, let's start with the big product announcement that okay. you had today. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, so we just announced Chronosphere Lens. And what Chronosphere Lens is, it's a new and more effective way for developers to interact with observability data, right? So you've heard of the, the phrase single pane of glass, and that's been the way observability vendors have approached the problem for a while now. But the problem with a single pane of glass is there's so much data these days, just seeing all of it in one place is actually not that useful. It's almost too much data, and yeah. developers are drowning in it. So what Chronosphere Lens does is it actually analyzes all of the raw observability data underneath the covers, and then extrapolates uh, insight and knowledge from that raw data and presents that information to the developer in a context that they want to solve their problems. So we found it to be far more effective and in fact, for Chronosphere customers, they're finding that they're reducing their SEV0, SEV1 incidents by about 75% or so. So it's a lot more Whoa. effective approach uh, to solving the problem uh, than the standard, but yeah. That's a considerable impact. Thank you, yeah. And, and, and I imagine it would have taken some calibration to, pun intended, figure out how to hone that lens to serve the developers the information exactly, they need in that exactly, moment. Exactly, exactly, right. So yeah, now you know why we call it a chronosphere lens, right? Because it's all about focusing um, into the, the data and the insights that's really relevant for an individual developer, right? Because remember, these systems we've built are really complex these days, and as a developer, yeah. I only own one part of the system. I don't actually want to see what's going wrong, because there's a lot of things going wrong with the whole system, right? I don't actually want to see all of it. I just want to hone in on what I care about and my dependencies, and that's what Lens does, is it helps you hone in on that uh, piece there. But, yeah. It helps them focus, and I, I think you, exactly. you also announced that there was new uh, change event tracking as well as part of that, and, and I think it's, to your point, bringing it all together and being able to coordinate that information. Uh, 100%, so great point there. So with change event tracking, we're tracking every change that happens to a system, a deployment, a new piece of infrastructure, those changes there. But to your point, for the whole system, there are a lot of changes, right? So what I really want to see is not just all the changes. What are the changes relevant to me as a developer? What are the changes that I need to know about uh, that, that, again, in context helps me solve my problem? So we did add event tracking, but the, the trick with it with Lens is that we, we scope down and focus on just the events that are relevant for that particular incident there. But yeah, yeah, because yeah, I mean, I, you know, a lot of times it's garbage in, garbage out, and you're drowning in data and things yeah. of that nature. So this really helps them focus in on what they're trying to achieve with their piece of an application, be it you know a microservice or a container, or hey, if they're more of the platform engineering type people. A hundred percent. It, it's what they own. To, to your point, it's a microservice or a piece of infrastructure there. But it's also the dependencies, right? Because it's not just what I own, it's what I'm dependent on, it's what's dependent of me. So it's more than just their tiny piece of the world, but it's not the whole, it's not the whole thing, all right? Um, but yeah, that's the focus there. And then to help with the drowning in data, you can imagine the drowning in data is causing a whole bunch of cost problems for the industry right now. That's where I was well. going to so drive this next. We're, we're yeah. trying to solve, well, we're not trying, we are solving that problem at the same time uh, as well there. But yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so what we find is that when a company adopts cloud native, uh, what they see is a, on average, a 12.4x increase increase in the volume of data that's being produced, right? That's an order of magnitude more data. And the reason why people spend so money on observability tooling, it's not because the vendors are being greedy, it's actually because there's so much more data, these systems cost uh, a lot more, 
because of that, right? And it's one of these unintended side effects. When you adopt cloud native, you know, you can imagine you're not really paying for the cloud providers to run Kubernetes for you. You're really paying for the VMs and the hardware underneath the covers there. So the cost of the infrastructure is the same, um, and yet you run a different architecture. The, the, the workload you can put through it is roughly the same, but your observability bill grows potentially 12.4x. So that's a huge problem that the industry is facing right now. And what we're trying to do with that is actually um, help companies control the growth of data there. And one of the tricks we learned is we can't just make it cheaper, unfortunately, uh, because there's diminishing returns on how efficient you can get the back ends uh, there, and, and the data is exploding in an exponential format. Right. So it's not just about making it cheaper. It's actually the trick is to understand and show uh, the companies and the customers um, what is costing you all of, of, like, of your expensive bill, what is causing all of that cost, and out of the data, what is valuable and what isn't valuable. And we're really trying to get people to match, okay, I want to spend money only on my valuable use cases, so how do I go and, and match those two things together and make sure I only spend money on my valuable use cases? And we're able to do that through a feature called the control plane in Chronosphere, and on average our customers are optimizing their data about 60%, and you can imagine therefore saving at least 60% on their observability bills there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you've always it's been impressive. known for, for no overage contracts and things of that nature. Exactly. How, how has that really been helping you in the past year since we talked last? Yeah, it's been helping, you can imagine the, the economy hasn't been great in the past yeah. year, right? So a lot of companies have been pressured, they don't have extra budget. So the, the concept of an overage is really uh, painful for a lot of companies because it's, you didn't budget for it intern, like internally originally, uh, and now you have to go find discretionary budget in order to cover the overage. We hate that model and we don't believe in that model at all. So in our product, there is no concept of an overage. Uh, so what we get companies to do is we use this control plane in order to control that growth of data and avoid overages there. And the behavior we actually saw in our, uh, with the companies that we work with this year is that they actually went back and used the tooling to go and optimize the data further as their budgets weren't expanded. So that's a behavior we saw this year and we're really happy that we're able to help customers control both their, their, their data volume growth as well as their cost there. But yeah. And it makes sense that it's built in and you're using your own tool to help them navigate what that even looks like. 100%, 100%. It yeah. makes perfect sense, very synergistic. When we chatted last year, you mentioned that observability was just beginning. Yeah. Where are we at a year later here in Chicago? I would say it's definitely advanced a lot since last yeah. year, right? And I think the overall cloud native journey has, has advanced a lot. Like if you look at this show, this reminds me of maybe San Diego 2019. Like it feels like, you know, the, uh, the buzz around cloud native is back. And we see in the industry, especially around yes. the, the enterprises, right? Like the enterprises yeah. are really, they've been thinking about this for years. And in the last year, we've really seen that the enterprise actually start to take action and actually shift workloads over to cloud yeah. native architecture. So that trend has continued and along with that, you really need observability and cloud native observability are there. So that trend just continues on, um, but yeah. yeah. So what are we going to say a year from now? I think that trend will only continue uh, for from a year yeah. from now. I do think a lot more companies are going to run into a lot of these cost challenges, because again, as you make this transition, the data loads are going to grow, and there'll be even more pressure and cost. I don't think we, we turn back to a 2021 economy, I think. There's a, new, there's a new level of efficiency expectation around. So I think that trend will continue, um, and I think you know, there's going to be a need for tools that are much better at focusing on the problem and being more effective at solving the problem, because that, that's just a, a, a really bad trend in the industry yeah. as well. I I mean, it's, it's one of the things that we he hear from organizations is, hey, I, ha I, I don't have an observability problem. I have, I have 10 tools in this space. Yeah. And I think what a lot of them are looking for is really a platform. Yeah. And it seems like that's really the direction you're going and the approach you're taking. It's, it's both the platform for sure, because you need to consolidate yeah. those tools down. But even when you do that to, to perhaps one platform, you don't just want one platform in a single pane of glass. It actually goes a little further than that as well. And hence, the chronosphere lens there, right? So we're trying to be two steps ahead of where people ultimately uh, need to go, but yeah. Well, if you're two steps ahead, where are yeah. we going with generative AI? That's a great question. I think a lot of buzz uh, in the space. And what we found when we played around with it, just like most other companies there, are the public models are interesting, for sure. But the problem with the public models is they're never built on your company's data, right? So if you think about observability, what you want to know is, what are the issues with my system? And the public models are not trained on your company data, so therefore they're not quite as effective. So we started down this path, and it actually uh, matches with what we're doing with Chronosphere Lens, which is analyze the raw data and build, not quite a vector database, but build, build a knowledge 
knowledge graph on top of the raw data and have that, which is specific to a particular company, go fuel the insights that you want to go present. And then when we built that piece, we thought about it and we're like, actually, you know what, the interface, the chat interface is interesting for some use cases. For the observability use case, it's actually not the best because you don't actually want to ask it proactively like, what's wrong with my system? It's much better for the tool just to tell you, here's what's wrong with my system. And you want it constantly giving you that exactly, information exactly, as necessary. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and perhaps text interface is not the best. You know, you really want it as a visual thing of like, this is what's wrong and let me show you what's wrong there. So what we found is actually Lens is a much more effective way of presenting that information. It's a similar awesome. uh, dynamic to, to what a lot of these AI models are, but we just don't think chat is quite as effective as, as, as the main interface to observability. But we did do a lot of playing around there and I do think you know, there is a general trend in that direction uh, for yeah, sure. And you don't have to do all the prompt engineering as exactly a person, the prompt. As, as we have our own LLM and I, I can tell yeah. you that I, I, I gotten very good at writing prompts. Exactly. <laughs> you have to be really good at it, and you have to know. It's an art. It's yeah. art. Yeah. And you have to know what questions to ask, right? Yes. Whereas, like, if we can just tell you what the answers are, you don't need to figure out what questions yeah. to ask, right? It's it's more effective that way. But yeah. Well, and you want to be anticipating what those questions are going to mean, exactly. Exactly. And eventually meet. Them. I mean, isn't that actual and, AI? And, and like, the, yeah. The whole point of observability is we want to show what's wrong with the system, right. rather than have you ask, well, is it this? Nope. Is it this? Nope. Is it this? Nope. Right. right? So. Yeah. And troubleshooting. When you're in a moment of panic too, and something's not working, the last thing you want to do is be it's trial and erroring. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So hence, you can imagine an interface where it's like, look, we know who you are. Yeah. We know why you're here because you're not just randomly perusing this tool. Like you're here for a reason. Yeah, we yeah. just paged you, and here are some of the areas that, that are wrong. Right? Like pro proactively presenting that information in a very curated way um, is is what we found to be a more effective approach. Uh, but yeah, yeah. and, and we, it would seem like there's. Definitely consolidation in the industry. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, going on, and it would seem that that makes a lot of sense because if you looked out here a couple of years ago, it was almost all observability yeah. companies. Yeah. Now, now that's you know shrank down a bit. Yeah. There's still quite a good core. How do how do you see that that part in the openness that's going on here yeah. helping you drive that in your company? Yeah, I think the openness and like uh, industry standards like open telemetry, things like Fluent and Fluent Bit and Fluent D, I think that really actually opened up the industry quite a lot and actually made room for new companies like Chronosphere to enter because you are now no longer like, locked into these proprietary agents that are producing the data for you. So it's actually better for the world overall because you know, as a company, I now am not locked into one particular vendor. I can actually instrument and own the data creation myself and I can pick whichever tool I want. It also opened the door for new players like Chronosphere to enter and really uh, reduce the moat of the incumbent players that were here. And then of course earlier this year, a lot of the big companies out there were taking private, so that does you know, pave the way for perhaps new companies to go take their spot. Um, so that's something we're very excited about, but yeah. That's great, no, totally makes sense as well. Yeah, yeah, so let's talk, uh, I, I suspect there's probably a little bit of privacy around this. What are yeah. some of the partners and players that you're getting to support on their journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, you know, on the partnership side, what we look at is from a problem perspective, what are problems that our customers can solve using our tools, and then what are other problems that they can't solve, because we can't solve everything under the sun, right? So what Not are yet. problems? Not sure? Yet. We're soon, working on why? Yeah, the exactly. fifth appearance maybe? Sixth exactly. appearance here on the exactly. show? I love it, Martin. We'll check yeah. back in next year. But yeah, uh, yeah. there are certain things that we, we can't uh, do well, right? So we we really want to find complementary partners there, and we found great partnerships uh, with particular companies like CrowdStrike out there, where we have a good partnership with them uh, on, on, Makes a on lot some of, sense, of their actually. use cases there, right? Yeah. So, so we do try to partner, and again, as a smaller company, it's more effective for us to partner with best in breed solutions out there um, where, where we focus. I do think the good thing about our partnership is we're also looking for companies that are really aimed at the future, at cloud native environments as opposed to yeah. non cloud native environments, right? So there's a lot of good partnerships, a lot of them are on the floor here uh, at the show, a lot of good partnerships for us. Uh, from that perspective. Yeah. I yeah. bet, and I bet everybody wants to work with you with that $115 million purse. It, it helps, it helps. What is uh, the capital yeah. going to unlock for you in terms of your yeah. ability to scale? Uh, big investment in the product, so to your point, we don't do everything yet, but we will. <laughs> soon. Uh, soon. All right, set the timer uh, right now, Martin. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, a lot more investment in the product, and I think a lot more investment in the product because um, companies are looking for platforms. They're not looking for 10 different solutions. They're looking for right. fewer and fewer. They're looking for consolidation. So Decreasing we do want to expand our, our product suite there. We do want to make sure we stay ahead. So you know, the Gen AI conversation was very interesting. We want to make sure we invest enough in the right ways there to stay ahead and not get caught out that way. So a lot of investment there. A lot of investment also on the go-to-market side as well. You know, you can imagine yeah. the popularity of the product and the company is, is, is growing as well and that has to fuel that growth there. So you know, more, more capital for growth I would say. But yeah. yeah. And, and 
I think uh, what I've liked about it and have been briefed by you guys before is that you really focus on confidence, control, and context as kind of the three pillars for your roadmap. And how does that help you with focus as well? And Because you could say, hey, we're going to make bets all over the place with the money, but it would seem like that wouldn't give confidence, control, or a context. Well. Exactly, and, and you put it in better words than I can. Those are exactly the, the, the three things, and they all begin with C, right? So to, to your point, it's about focus on those three areas, right? Because when we looked at the problem, there wasn't a need for necessarily just another tool. There were enough tools out there, right? We really looked at what is everyone struggling with, and what everyone's struggling with is cost and, and controlling the data growth. So that's one area we want to focus Especially on. Especially right now. Especially yeah. right now, so that's yeah, one area we, we've been focusing deal. on for years already. Second one is context, because the effectiveness of these tools just weren't there anymore for the new environment. So, so that was the second one. And third one is the, the confidence and the reliability. Observability, this is the thing that's telling you how reliable is your product and service. So if this thing isn't reliable, there's no way you can be reliable as a company, right? So that was a, a cornerstone of the company. Those are honestly the three main strategies there. So everything we invest in has to form one of those three categories there. And that's what allows us to stay focused. So while we look at other things that have to be aligned, like the, the, uh, the chronosphere lens piece, it's aligned on the context, right? We, we don't do it if it's not context, if it's not about control, if it's not about confidence. We don't really make those investments, but yeah. Well stated, we got the three C's now. We're going to have to bring that out yes. in a lot of our... From Chronosphere, right? Yeah, so, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, From yeah. Chronosphere, no less. Oh yeah. my God, it's brilliant. Well, having, having been a product guy, I appreciate focus and pillars and, and yeah, gives yeah. you that North Star to aim for. And I, yeah. I think... Dude, and alliteration. And alliteration. And, and alliteration. <laughs> or another, okay or another TLR. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> TLA, that R. It's all right, we don't have to yeah, kill no, everyone. Anyway. We don't have to kill everyone with acronyms. What does it mean for you? I mean, I can feel the energy. It's loud in here right now, it's yeah. exciting. What does it mean for you and the team to be here at KubeCon? Look, this is our favorite event all year long, we love it right? Too. That's why we, I we, we it up. love yeah. it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this year feels reminiscent of KubeCon San Diego, where like yeah. pre-pandemic, it felt like, and it's not like the trend to cloud native has slowed down at all, but I think the in-person energy from shows like this hasn't quite quite returned yet. Last year we're getting close. This year I really feel it. So I think, you know, it's a Agree. it's 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 great um, uh, you know, I would say reinforcement of how far we've come in the cloud and native space and the fact that this is still the future that everyone, the whole industry is moving towards. So we love it, favorite show of the year, and this is probably our favorite show, uh, or segment of the favorite show of the year uh, as well, so yeah. Uh, now you're just flattering us, <laughs> but we'll take it. We'll take it, so that means we'll see you in Paris then. Uh, I, I will be there in Paris, so we should definitely ask, uh, yeah, we, we we'll have to see what the fifth Paris. chat means. Yeah, I can't, see how I look goes, forward yeah. to that. That's only yeah. a few months from now too, five exactly. months away, fifth chat. Exactly. Maybe the I'm, fifth sure we'll have some, I'm, yeah. I'm sure we'll have some big news uh, to break by then, but yeah. Well, that is awesome. Martin, thank you so much for being here with us on the show. We're going to be showing off some of the things that are at your booth a little yes. bit later today it's on a separate segment, but truly looking forward to, to number five here. And congratulations again on the funding and the absolutely explosive growth as a company. It's inspiring to see. I think a lot of people need to see it, especially right now. Rob, thank you so much for being here, for hanging out, for matching the entire event, which right. is an accomplishment in itself. And thank you, most importantly, viewer, for tuning in. My name is Savannah Peterson, here in the Paris of the Prairie, Chicago, Illinois, at KubeCon, CNCF, Cloud Native Con, coming to you live all afternoon. Don't forget to join us on theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.